Thank you, Gregoire. Good morning. So we're going to talk about uh, deep learning in the machine, for lack of a better word. The machine, of course, is the brain or a neuromorphic chip. What I really mean here, it's a physical neural network. It's not the fantasy that you use in your computer when you're using uh, TensorFlow and doing ResNet or something like that. That is not a real native neural network, right? You don't have synaptic weights, you don't have neurons. You have a fantasy of such objects implemented in a digital computer. And this makes a big difference. And uh, I think there is uh, a lot to be learned by looking at uh, deep learning in a native neural network, in a physical system, rather than in the digital uh, simulation. And by taking into account the physical constraints of the real world on the real system, I think we can get new insights on the foundation of, of learning and occasionally even find algorithms that can improve uh, deep learning on, on, on computers. So how can we do this uh, learning in the machine? Well, the solution was found uh, a long time ago by, by Albert Einstein. If you walk a few hundred meters from here, there is Humboldt University, and that's uh, where Einstein spent some time. In fact, if you walk across the street, I recommend you go see there is a, a glass plate on the on the pavement through which you can see a, a, some, some uh, bookshelves and some books. And this is where the Nazi burnt, in 1933, burnt a lot of books from, by Einstein and, and, and many other um, great Jewish scientists and, and pacifists and so on. But anyway, if you, if you had met Einstein a few hundred meters from here and you had asked him how did he come up with the theory of special relativity, Everyone knows that he would have said, well, I just try to think that I was a ray of light. So basically imagination, try to be a ray of light, try to think how the world look, looks like if you are a photon. So here we're going to do the same thing. We're going to try to think that, try to think that you are a neuron or try to think you are a synapse or an axon and ask yourself how would the world around you look like. So that's what we're going to do, and I'm going to first give you a few simple examples of this style of thinking for neurons, but the place where we're going to get, I think, some, some interesting results is when we think about synapses. So here's the first example of this kind of thinking for a simple neuron. Imagine you're doing logistic regression, and I give you binary vectors to be classified into zero and ones, and the binary vectors that should be classified into ones are those that are connected, that is, where all the zeros are together and all the ones are together. With wraparound or not, that's a detail. Okay? So that's the task, and I ask you, you know, is this simple, is it easy, is it linearly separable, etc.? How does it compare to parity, for instance? And uh, if you're not used to this, you may look at this and you may think that this is a fairly simple task compared to parity, because parity, you have to look at all the bits and count whether there is an even or odd number of such bits. Whereas here, you just look at the pattern and you see immediately whether the ones are clamped together or not. That's your thinking when you use your visual system. But if now you put yourself in the shoes of this neuron, of this little logistic regression, the world looks completely different. There is no sense that the first bit is to the left of the second bit, to the left of the third bit, etc. That comes only from the, your visual system. In reality, this neuron has to learn the right permutation of all the n bits in order to solve this problem. And so it turns out it's a very hard problem. And you get completely fooled by not thinking in the machine. Another example of thinking in the machine is dropout because you could have, again, looked at the world from the point of view of a neuron. Maybe you come up with the idea that neurons are quite faulty. Maybe they don't work 50% of the time, so let's do that during learning, and that's exactly what dropout does. You remove 50% or some other fraction of your neurons during learning, you adjust the synapses, and then another group of neurons uh, is removed, etc., and you keep repeating that. So dropout, you could view it as a thinking in the machine type, type, type of thinking. Now note something interesting. When you do dropout at production time, your neurons are working perfectly. 
You just multiply the weights by the, the probabilities of dropping, and that's it. And so that maybe opens the door for having a better form of dropout, where you do dropout also at production time. And I think maybe you may gain a very small amount in, in accuracy by doing that. Nobody has done that, but it's probably a very small effect. It would require at production time to just average over a large number of networks rather than doing the pseudo quick average that you get by assuming that all the neurons are working properly. So that's dropout. Uh, other example of such thinking when you're looking at, uh, at neurons would be, for instance, relaxing the weight sharing assumption. It's very unlikely that in biological networks you have exact weight sharing, for instance, right? So how can you have a convolutional neural network that works well if you don't have uh, exact uh, weight sharing? Where you can show, for instance, that if you take a convolutional neural network and relax the weight sharing assumption, but you initialize the weight sort of from, from the same, typically from this zero mean Gaussian with small standard deviation, you can get them to learn provided you give them translated version of the examples so that every neuron, let's say in the first layer, sees roughly the same set of examples. So these are just examples of, of thinking in the machine from the point of view of neurons. Now I want to go to the point of view from, from the point of view of synapses, which I think is even more interesting. And this is, among other things, is going to help us answer question like, what exactly is Hebian learning? Hebian learning is, a, is an important concept, but it's somewhat uh, murky. You know, neuron that wire together, fire together. What, what does that mean exactly? What is the relation between Hebian learning and, and backpropagation? Is backpropagation Hebian, for instance? Uh, a question that, that uh, uh, may seem some, somewhat strange, but, but uh, important. And why are there so few learning algorithms? Because really, if you look at the literature, these are pretty much the only two algorithms that, that uh, are available for training networks. So why are there so few algorithms? So if we put ourselves in the shoe, imagine that, that you are a synapse, the important thing I want to um, impress on you is that to understand the, the world of a synapse, which is such a small object, you need to rescale things so that they become more, more palatable to you. So I'm going to rescale things by a factor of a million, a synapse is about 10 to the minus 7, so you rescale it by a million, it's 10 to the minus 1 meter, so about 10 centimeters, the size of my fist. And imagine Einstein is learning how to play the violin. Where is the bow of the violin? Well, it's maybe a 1 meter away, which when you rescale by 10 to the 6, that's 1,000 kilometers away, so maybe in Paris, right? Or Rome, if you are learning how to, to ride a bicycle. So you have this synapse, which is you know, embedded in these deep circuits in the brain that has to decide whether to strengthen itself or not, or, or weaken itself. And then it has no notion of, of music, of violin, etc. right? So how can it do that? And this is really the deep learning problem when you think about it in, in, in biological terms. So that's just the rescaling. So this leads immediately to the notion of local learning, because a synapse, in order to learn whatever the learning rule is, it has to depend on local variables that are available at, at the, in, the, in the neighborhood of the, of the synapse. So using these uh, high-level models that you were, were using, it means that you, one possible definition of local learning would be to, to say that you have a rule for adjusting your synaptic weights, which is some function of local variables such as the presynaptic activity, the postsynaptic activity, and maybe the weight itself. That's a reasonable definition of what a local learning rule ought to be. You're welcome to, to, to have your own definition, but within this formalism, I think this, this is very reasonable. Now, if you are, let's say you have a feed-forward network, you are in the output layer, then you may have targets, so maybe the targets could also be considered as local variables, in the output layer of a, of a feed-forward network, okay? So that's the definition of a, a local learning rules. And I think this is nice because now you can separate the, um, the variables that are in the learning rule, which need to be uh, local, from the functional form of the learning rule. So I can decide what functional form the function f should have. For instance, we can work on polynomial learning rules polynomials of low degree, maybe up to six, 
that could be an interesting uh, set of function. But in any case, we can stratify all possible learning rules and we can study them one by one. So we did that for polynomial learning rule of low degree for linear neurons. In some cases, you can do also uh, nonlinear neurons and you can study all these rules and their properties. And occasionally you can find rules that have some interesting capabilities. For instance, Oja, Oja's rule, which is a quartic rule actually, um, can extract the principal component of the data. Right? So these rules that, that, you, that you can study uh, can extract simple statistics of the, of the data, such as the center of gravity or, or, or the principal component. So it's interesting to know that and which rules converge, etc. But really what you care about is learning by combining these rules in a deep network. So here you have a deep feed-forward network and imagine that you're lo using local rules in the first layer, in the second layer, etc., all the way to the top layer. In the top layer you can have targets because the targets are available here, but not of course in the deeper layers of this feed-forward network. Right. And the question is, what can you do with this system? What can you learn? This is actually an old idea that goes back at least to 1980 with Fukushima, who, who came up with this architecture, which is nothing else than a convolutional neural network inspired by the work of Ewell Wiesel, etc. But in his paper, he said, well, we have adjustable weights between the layers, and we're going to learn using Hebb's rule some local learning rule. HAB is a special case of local learning. Well, no one has ever been able to, to make this work, as far as I know, and the reason is that it cannot work. So I'm going to tell you that if you stack things like this in a feed-forward network, you have data, and you use HAB rule or any local rule here, here, and here, and here, etc., you'll never be able to learn interesting functions. And the reason is actually quite simple. Is if you want to be able to learn things, a reasonable uh, condition for that is to say you should be able to reach ideally global minima of your error function, but let's say at least critical points where well, the gradient is zero. So you write the equation of the gradient is equal to zero. Those of you who know these things w well, of course, they understand that this is just writing backpropagation equals zero. So you can do it by, with uh, you know, large batches or just the full training set. So it's the average over the entire training set, let's say, of the, uh, for a weight Wij uh, connecting neuron J e to neuron I in layer H, neuron J in layer H minus one. Uh, it's the sum of the presynaptic activity in layer H minus one multiplied by the postsynaptic backpropagated error, right? This backpropagated error starts at the top of the network, depends on the target minus uh, output, and then gets multiplied by all the weights in a reverse direction in backpropagation, all the weights of the network. In addition, uh, every time you traverse a layer, you multiply by the derivative of the activations, nonlinear activation functions of that layer. So it's reasonable to assume that the solution uh, to these equations, you have one such equation for each weight, so you may have a billion equations, right? The solutions have to depend, for instance, on the targets, because this term depends on the targets, right? If you do this local learning in feedforward mode, this Abian learning applied layer by layer, you see immediately that the deep layer will never depend on the targets. And so you cannot learn um, such function. By the way, in this term, there is also uh, information about all the weights above uh, layer H, and we'll come back to that. Because it, it would seem from this equation that you need to know everything about all the weights above in order to find a solution, and, and that's an important point that is actually not true. Okay, so, Abian learning, or more generally deep local learning, stacked local learning in a feed for one neural network cannot learn complex functions. And so this leads to two new concepts, the concept of, of, of uh, deep learning channel and local, de local deep learning. So what do I mean by that? Well, we have seen that a deep weight has to depend on the targets, for instance, right? So there has to be a channel a in a physical system, in the machine, there has to be a channel that conveys information about the targets all the way down to the deep weights, 
There is no other way. Otherwise, you cannot solve those critical equations and have the hidden weights depend on the target. Okay? So there has to be this deep channel that conveys information about the targets and other things all the way from, let's say, the output back to the deep weights. In a physical system, in your digital you know, simulation fantasy, you don't worry about it. But in a physical system, you have to worry about it. And so we can ask, for instance, where is the channel located? What kind of information does it carry? Or, or what is the minimal amount of information that it has to carry? And what is the rate of the channel, etc.? All, all classical uh, um, Shannon theory of communication can be applied to this, uh, to this uh, object. So, if you think about the brain, if you think that you know, supervised learning is sort of a reasonable approximation to some form of biological learning, what I'm telling you is that there has to be a channel that goes all the way from, from the motor output or from wherever error functions are computed, all the way back to each one of these synapses. Otherwise, they cannot, they cannot learn. And this is uh, um, important also because it shows that the notion of feedback, that, that, that you know, the word feedback has actually two completely different meanings that have to be separated. There is one type of feedback that is uh, relatively fast, that may occur, let's say, in biological neurons on a scale of uh, 10, 10 to 100 milliseconds. For instance, a visual system, uh, you know, we often talk about feedback where you have a, 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 a bottom-up sensory uh, stream that meets a top-down expectation or modeling stream, and together these two streams combine to, to, to stabilize your, your uh, perception, your percept of, of, of the world, right? That's the kind of feedback that is sort of dynamical and very fast, again, on the scale of tens to 100 milliseconds. Here we're talking about deep learning feedback, the feedback for learning, which can be much slower, could be hours, could be days, and, and could perhaps use the same pathways, but also possibly completely different pathways. We, we definitely know that in the brain, you have tons of connections going in the, in the feedback direction. But again, two different possible notions of, of feedback. So let's discuss first uh, where can this channel be in different uh, neural systems. Again, you see immediately that there is a number of possibilities. You could have a system where signals can travel in both directions along axons, right? You can have systems where you have separate connections, but they are sort of identical. You use the transpose of the forward weights in the reverse. This is sort of what you think when you're doing your digital fantasy in your, in your computer, right? That's the way you think about it. If you, again, if you think about biology, many have pointed out it's, it's very unlikely that you have exact weights in the opposite direction, right? You could have a twin situation where you have a, a, a deep learning channel that has the same architecture as the forward, but is completely separate, but with the same architecture, and then in my opinion, the most plausible one is that you have a completely distinct channel that has different architecture and different numbers of neurons, etc. But of course, which talks to the, the forward pathway and through, through different sets of weights, and, and that's what I call the distinct case. But for any uh, physical system, you can think about these different possibilities and what happens uh, with learning, with, with uh, rates, etc., in these different uh, scenarios. Now, one important result that was obtained by uh, Lili Krapp et al. was that if you put completely random weights on the way back, back propagation still works, which is somewhat amazing. You don't need to have the transpose of the forward weight on the deep learning channel. You can have completely random matrices, and if you do the simulation, you see that it works uh, almost as well as uh, plain backpropagation. So that's a remarkable result. And it opens the door for doing a lot of studies on, on these different architectures. So you can do studies on these different architectures using random weights on the backward pass. But on not only that, you can ask all kinds of questions. On the backward pass, typically you have a linear network. 
All the operations you do are matrix multiplication, you multiply maybe by the derivatives, etc. Why should the backward channel be linear and the forward pass uh, channel be nonlinear? Right? You may want in a physical system use the same kind of hardware in both directions, so you may try to have nonlinear neurons in the learning channel. You like to use dropout on the forward channel. Why not use dropout on the backward channel? Um, you like sparse matrices. Maybe we want to use sparse matrices in the backward channel. Random sparse matrices. And what about these derivatives? Do you really need to multiply by the derivatives of the forward channel in the backward channel? Do you need all the derivatives, just the derivatives of, of the current layers? Um, you adjust the weights in the forward channel by HAB. HAB and backpropagation become essentially the same once you have the backward learning channel. But why not adapt also the weights in the backward channel? Maybe if they are made of the same hardware, you should be use HAB or backpropagation in both channels, in the forward channel and the deep learning channel. And if you look at this architecture, you can also have skipped connections like this, in fact, you can have an architecture that has only skip connections, where basically you have connections running from the top layer back to all the different layers. So that's what we call a fully skipped architecture. So you see that you end up with lots of you know, possibilities, and we've tried all of them essentially, maybe 100 or 200 simulations of all the combinations. And the main result is that the deep learning channel is very robust. That is, most of these combinations, they work or you can get them to work. They, they may be a, li a little harder to get to work than, back, than plain backpropagation, but if you spend some time tweaking the learning rate, etc., you can get most of them to work. There is a couple of them that do not work. For instance, if you get rid of all the derivatives, you don't multiply by any derivative in the deep learning channel, then you won't be able to learn well. You do need those derivatives. In fact, you, you can show even more than that. You only need the derivative of the, of, the, of the current layers. You don't need the derivatives above the current layer like backpropagation does. Backpropagation uses all the derivatives above. You actually don't need all of them. If you have a skipped architecture, you can get rid of all those derivatives, and, but you will need the derivative of the current layer. And also another thing that is important that you see also in, in, uh, when you do <coughs> the work of Lily Krupp is that the, the random weights start here, so they play a role in, 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 in learning for the layer before the last one, but the last layer is doing gradient descent, and that's, that's absolutely necessary. If you remove the gradient descent from the top layer, then all these algorithms uh, start to break down. I can show you some example of simulation on NIST or CIFAR, so these are examples of this is backpropagation, this is skipped backpropagation, skipped random backpropagation, random backpropagation, this is without the derivatives, etc. You can see that they all converge at different speeds, but they all converge. If you remove the derivatives, these guys are not learning. This is the training set, this is the test set. Um, this is another set of experiments where we're looking at adaptive random backpropagation. So we're adapting the weights both on the forward channel and on the deep learning channel using the same rule, you know, product of uh, presynaptic time uh, postsynaptic uh, error, if you want, so to speak, training set, test set, you can see they all converge to, to uh, good performance, et cetera, et cetera. These are experiment done with sparse random matrices with different level of sparsity, et cetera. Um, same thing. Same thing on CIFAR. This is just to show you an interesting uh, technique for some simulation that comes from a paper by, by Sabatini et al. What you have at the top is your data. So there is a mathematical function that has a parameter k that allows you to adjust the complexity of the data. So if with k equal 1, this is your data. k equal 2, it's like this, etc. So as k grows, you have more and more black dots in this picture, right? The picture becomes more and more complicated. It has to do with Betty numbers. And <clears throat> basically, the task of your network is you give it as input two values, x and y, and the output is the prediction, the classification to black and white. And these networks here have uh, hidden layers of size 500, and there is maybe four or five hidden layers. And backpropagation is here, 
you know, is able to learn very well the patterns. This is the data. This is what backpropagation produces. And these are some of the other algorithms, for instance, random backpropagation. And you see that at low complexity, it matches the data and backpropagation very well. At high complexity, at the same, you know, training, uh, at the same epoch, it's a little bit behind and there are variations across the different algorithms. This one doesn't seem to be doing very well, but, you know, again, tweaking learning rate, etc., you can get even this one after a while to look exactly like this. Um, so, now I want to tell you about what needs to be communicated in, in this channel. And basically, you can see that you can reduce the amount of information that is needed. From the critical equation, you get the impression that you need to transmit you know, the targets, the output, all the weights above, all the weights below, and all the derivatives above. Backpropagation alone already tells you that you only need, in fact, to send T minus O. You don't need to send T and O se separately. Uh, you don't need all the weights below. In fact, all, the only thing you need is, um, is the activity of the presynaptic neurons. So all the, weight b the, uh, all the information about all the weights below is subsumed by the activity of the presynaptic neurons. Uh, this, by the way, suggests that it should be the same for all the weights above. You, you really don't need to know everything about all the weights above in the same way that you don't need to know, know about all the weights below. And this is exactly what uh, leads and, and, and is shown by random backpropagation because random backpropagation has completely random weights in the layer uh, above to the layer that you're trying uh, to, um, uh, to learn. And then we skip the random backpropagation. We see that we don't need all the derivatives of the layers above. You just need the derivative of, of the current layer. So basically what, what, it seems, what seems to work, the minimal amount of, of things that you need to send is some function of T minus O. A linear, uh, a, a random matrix of T minus O will work. A random sparse matrix will work. Uh, you can reduce the precision on T minus O quite a bit not down to one bit, if you do just one bit, the sign of T minus O it doesn't seem to work, but a low precision version of T minus O times a random sparse matrix will work, plus the derivative of the current layer. Uh, you may guess that if you multiply this by a matrix, it would have to be a full rank matrix, and it's uh, five minutes left, it's, it's, it's about right, but it's not a sharp threshold. That is, if the random matrix is full rank, it works well. If, if it's one rank below the full rank, it will still sort of learn. No, there, there will be a graceful degradation in, in performance. There will not be a, a co complete collapse. So that, those are simulation results. Can we prove anything? Well, we can start with very simple networks. This is a simple linear network, for instance with uh, two, two layers, in this case three layers. You have weights A and B on the forward channel, uh, weight C in the deep uh, reverse channel, and you can write down the equations of uh, such a system. In fact, some of this is in, uh, in the lily crowd paper. We have uh, uh, extended the theorem a little bit. But you can see that the stable points are given by these hyperbolas here where the products of the weights A and B is uh, some constant, the right constant. And you can see in this phase space, as all these points are attractors, all the arrows are converging. If you start here, you have a parabolic trajectory that ends up here. And here is the same thing, except for this little piece of this hyperbola, where actually the, um, uh, the points are unstable. Uh, and, and, and the trajectories tend to diverge from those points, but they will converge on some other points on those, on those hyperboles. So, for that very s simple system, you can understand what happens. But of course, you would like to understand more complex systems. Even in the linear case, you could have a multi-layer linear network. All these are matrices, forward matrices. You have random matrices on the way back whether you do it in the skip fashion as drawn here or in the propagation fashion, it's essentially equivalent. And if you write the learning equation for the matrices A, you get essentially this thing, because it's very easy to see that, because it's just the uh, transpose of the 
of the stream coming from the forward pathway, which is this object here. There is an uh, input transpose here. And then there is the, the feedback matrix CI times the what is at the top, T minus O. When it combines with the input, you get this, this quantity here. So this is the covariance matrix of the uh, targets with respect to the inputs. P is the product of all the matrices, and this is the covariance matrix of the input data. If your backward uh, pathway is also adaptive, you get these equations for adapting the C, so you get a huge system of differential equations. And just for comparison, these are the systems that you get for, for uh, backpropagation. So can we solve such systems? Well, in general, no. These are actually very complicated systems. These are polynomial systems of differential equations. And uh, if you are in one dimension, if you have uh, dx dt equal p of x, that we understand qualitatively quite well. I will show you an example at the very end, but basically you cannot have oscillations. You either have convergence to fixed points or divergence to infinity. But if you have two differential equations, dx dt equal p of x, y, dy dt equal q of x, y, just two equations with two polynomials, that is extremely difficult. In fact, Hilbert's 16 problem is the question of whether you can bound the number of limit cycle of such a system. And that question is completely unsolved. Steve Smail wrote a paper 15 years ago, the new version of Hilbert's problem for the 21st century. It's in there, and basically no progress has been made on this question for, for many decades. It's a little bit like uh, P equal NP. So these are problems that are very difficult, but in some restricted cases, we can solve them. For instance, if you have a long chain of a very deep chain of units that are all linear, I'll show you this at the very end. Uh, if you have a system with uh, one unit, n units in the hidden layer, then one unit, this guy here, we can solve, etc. There are interesting connections to, to, to complex ideas in algebraic geometry, like uh, causal complex. I won't go in, into that. And in some cases, you can solve the, the nonlinear case. For instance, if you have uh, th uh, the case with three units like this, where you put a nonlinearity here, like a, a power uh, function, for instance, that case we, we, we can solve and show that it converge. So just to finish, let me show you what happens in this case. So these two problems are equivalent. Again, the, the skipped version versus the propagated version are equivalent. So let's stick with the skipped version. What you have here is a chain of uh, linear neurons. Everything is linear. If I give you an input, it gets multiplied by A1, A2, AL. So the output is uh, A1, A2, AL times the input. Let's call P the product of all these weights. Obviously, you're trying to learn what's the right combination of weights, so you're adjusting a line. <coughs> and very simple problem, it's even convex, but you, each one of these little weights, it's applying its own uh, learning rule based on these random feedback weights, CL. These, these weights are fixed, but completely random. So if you write the differential equations, they look like this. That's a system of differential equations that is satisfied by this uh, large set of, of weights. If you look carefully, you can see that any two consecutive equations are coupled in this way, which means that the evolution of AI plus one is a quadratic function of AI, right? So A2 is a quadratic function of A1, A3 is a quadratic function of A2, so it's a quadratic function of A1, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, you can take the equation of A1, you, you can write A1, there is the product P of all the AI, you replace each AI as its a function of A1, it's a you know, large polynomial of, degree, uh, e of even degree, and you end up with an equation that looks like this, D, DA1 DT equals a big polynomial of A1, and if you look carefully, the polynomial is um, of degree 2L minus 1, so it's an odd polynomial with an odd degree and a negative leading coefficient. So it is something that looks like this, right? And so if you start anywhere, suppose you start here, it says the derivative is negative, so you're gonna move like this and you're gonna end up to this fixed point here, right? If you start here, the same thing, the derivative is positive, so you're gonna end up here. Uh, 
Now, if you start here at minus infinity, or, or your derivative is positive, so you're going to move and end up here, and the same thing here. If you start here, your derivative is negative, so you're going to move to the left and, and end up here. So no matter where you start, this system is converge, convergent and will converge to the right solution. So although you have completely random weights in the feedback channel, although this could have a million layers, by magic, this system will always converge to a correct solution. Um, OK, I'm out of time, so let me summarize. Learning the machine is, uh, looks at learning in physical neural system, not in the digital fantasy that, that, that we use. Um, thinking about, the, about synapses and their environment leads to the notion of local learning. The rules for adjusting a synaptic weight should depend only on local variables. This leads to the notion of deep learning channel. If you depend only on local variable and you have a feed-forward network, you will never be able to learn anything interesting. You need a, a backward channel, the deep learning channel, to uh, communicate information about the targets all the way to the deep weights. The deep learning channel appears to be, in simulation, very robust to all kinds of perturbation and variations in algorithms, in topology, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> we have sort of a corner, what is the minimal information that is required uh, to enable learning in deep synapses. And in some cases, we can build a, a, a mathematical theory, but ultimately, this, leads, this area leads to systems of polynomial uh, differential equations, which are uh, quite difficult to solve. Thank you. Other questions? Um, hi. Hi. Um, hi. I'm very interesting that basically you showed that this robustness is there in this uh, learning rules. Um, what I wonder is what is the gap in performance that you get if you go away from the um, classical backpropagation? So well, you see you here use? in these simulations. Um, Yes. You know, typically the top curve is backpropagation, so this may be omnist. So in 20 epoch, uh, backpropagation is essentially 100%, and uh, skipped uh, or, or random backpropagation may be at uh, 95 or 96. So you see, it's a little bit slower, but ultimately it gets there. I mean, why I ask is because basically in reinforcement learning with the temporal differencing, you also work with noisy gradients at one point, and yeah, empirically it shows that just noisy gradients cost you something in, in performance and training time. So do you think that this can be related here? Possibly, possibly. I mean, for for simple system like the one, the long chain, we, we sort of know how long it takes for the system to converge. So we can compare what happens with random weights in the backward pass or where if you use the transpose of the forward weights, compare the two and then we we can get some, some scaling there. But there is no fun I don't expect that there is any, any fundamental difference. OK, thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, my first qu uh, question, I guess, is answered already about the speed of convergence. Um, um, so what happens when you try it on, on MNIST or one of these data sets? What you see in the curves. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. yeah. So backpropagation may converge in 20 epochs. And one of the other variants may take 50 or 100 epochs, but it will get there in a reasonable time. Yeah, Max. Okay. So, uh, as a follow up, what about the wall clock time? I guess with randomized weights, you kind of save some computation, so, but you need longer time for convergence. So, does it end up at the same wall clock time roughly, or is it? Um, so, is there some. Do I get some speed improvements if I don't? If you use random weights? Yeah. No, you'll be slower. You don't improve your speed. You mean your, your speed of conversion in terms of epochs? Right. But I need to do less computation, right? I guess, because I don't need to compute the gradients. Well, you still have to, if you use the random matrices, you still have to multiply by random matrices, multiply by derivative, multiply by random matrices. So if you do you know, standard backpropagation with random weights, the number of calculations is the same. It's just that you're using random weights instead of using uh, 
you know, the transpose of the forward matrices. Pierre, have you, have you studied, um, you know, what kind of randomness you should be using? Like, um, it's what, very what, robust. What process? Have you changed process? Yeah, we changed process, you know. Again, we, we tried, uh, so of course Gaussian, mm -hmm. but then we tried sparse matrices with coin flips. Mm -hmm. That's okay. fine. Okay. Um, I'm not so much worried about uh, convergence speeds, but I would be interested if you would use this to not single networks, but ensembles of such networks with random backpropagation type weights, whether these would have um, potentially a better performance than, say, an average of simply backpropagated neural networks. I see maybe a little bit relationships, uh, you know, random weights that conver convey information back to maybe human creativity, where maybe you need to make an error to find a good solution. Yeah, so I haven't tried to do an ensemble of back propagations, but we have done dropout on the way back, which is a little bit like averaging an ensemble. We don't see, you know, any, any but it doesn't hurt you, but it doesn't buy you anything obvious, at least in, in the simulations that we've done. Um, so, I can, you can use, for example, message passing to train uh, the layers of a network, or more general, you can use variational inference. For example, you um, compute a posterior distribution given the input, uh, compute a posterior distribution given uh, the target, and then try to match the two distributions. And this is, ex for example, how a variational autoencoder will work, and also deep variational autoencoder will have a very similar structure to the one you propose with the encoding network, the coding network, and skip connections between the two. So I was wondering, is there any way of making a formal connection between uh, variational inference uh, and what you're trying to do here? Um, possibly. I haven't, I haven't really thought about it, but... Mm. Um. Yeah, because in a way, so in a variational encoder, for example, uh, you will get a feedback, uh, uh, which is exactly a quantity of information we can, you can actually measure in nuts, uh, and you use that quantity of information to correct uh, and update your layers. Uh, so it feels very much like what you're trying to do here. Yeah. Time for one last question. Yeah, just a very simple question. So uh, when does it fail? It cannot always work, or can it? Or right, so I gave some example where it fails. For instance, if you don't have, if, you, if on the learning channel, you completely forget the derivatives, right? You put random matrices or even the transpose of the, ma of the forward matrices, but you don't multiply by derivatives, then it doesn't work. Uh, but an, That's an, an example. In, in terms of applications, there's, uh, so the, the, the data sets you have tried, it always uh, seem to work? Or? The variations that, that work, yes. They work on CIFAR, they tr we tried on NIST, we tried on another data set that I didn't show. Yes. Some are more finicky, you know, they, they require more hyperparameter tuning, but... Uh, Did you try just adapting the last layer? I mean, there's this echo state idea. If you adapt only the last layer on, on a difficult function, it's not going to work. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again. <coughs>